Thanks for inviting me to give a talk. I've really enjoyed the conference so far. And so just, uh, so let's begin with some historical motivations. So suppose you have exobonic space and you have its associated group of isometries on one hand and its group of isomorphisms on another. And we wanna know if there's any sort of information that can be gained about its isomorphic structure given its isometric structure. And so it turns out though that unfortunately, if you can say unfortunately, there's not that much information in a certain sense that you can gain from it. And the reason is given these kinds of results. So, so Bell now showed that if you have a separable Barnack space, you can renorm your X with an equivalent norm so that the only remaining uh, isometries are the trivial ones, plus or minus the identity. And you can even do so in such a way that um, your norm has as little distortion as you'd like. So, and later, just a few years later, it was shown that you can put an equivalent renorming for any Banach space so that the only isometries remaining are your trivial isometries. So in, in this, in this um, the kind of proof strategy that was seen in, the, in at least in Dano's paper, I don't quite remember what happened in the other one, um, was that first you renorm your bonic space with an equivalent uh, locally uniformly rotund or locally uniformly convex renorming. And then you add, and this is what they, they actually call these uh, pimples <laughs> um, to the uniball to do away with unwanted isometry. So, so basically, you know, assuming, you know, just a, an example with, with L2, right? You have a lot of isometries, right? And so what you just wanna do is can put something like this and something like that. And then you might wanna do like a little one right here. And assuming these are small enough so that you don't mess around too much with the convexity, just adding a few of those can remove all of these isometries, right? So now, because when you have an isometry, you need to have pimples going to pimples of the same size and shape, right? So that's, that's the idea that, that Bellano used to kill isometry. Um, so can we do the same with any Banach lattice? And there's, there's a complication, right? And so with, um, with Bonac spaces, you can use, you can renorm the Bonac space so it has this LUR property. But if you want to have an LUR lattice renorming, your lattice has to be order continuous. Um, you can have an LUR renorming, it just won't be a lattice, a lattice norm. So if you want to, if you want to kill isometries with lattices that are not order continuous, you have to use a different strategy. And so what we did was we looked at the class of AM spaces, which are very much not order continuous unless you're dealing with C0. And so just brief um, introduction, you have a bound class X is called an AM space. If for any disjoint X and Y, the norm of X plus Y is the same as the max of the norms of X and Y. And um, this is like a full floor result that you can have um, any AM space is a sublattice of a C of K space for some compact hostel of K. And you can even express concretely these AM spaces in the following <coughs> way. So you have some indexing set I, and then you have these uh, tuples S I, T I, and lambda I. S I and T I are elements in K, and lambda I is some real number greater than or equal to zero. And we can say then that X is equal to all of your continuous functions over K, so that X of Ti is equal to lambda I times X of Si. So if you had, I'm gonna draw an example here because the example will be used later. So you might have say some, you can have some function X, right? And then we say, all right, well, all of these points have to have the same ratios right here, right? And I'm also gonna require the condition that all of these have to have the same relation. So anything that's white, you can move around, um, but this has to be 
you can only have um, scalar multiples of this portion, right? Then you might need something that goes to zero at some point. Right. So just see, you have something like that. And then, so these are, for instance, your SI and TIs all relate to each other, you know, fixed. And you also might have some conditions where some points are zero. And that's basically how these AM spaces look like in the concrete. So the main result we're going to show is that if you have X a separable AM space and you have some C greater than one, then X can be equipped with an equivalent lattice norm that is C equivalent. So just distortion by amount C. And the identity map is the only lattice isometry on your renormed X. We also have that if it has no more than one atom, um, your norm can be chosen to be an AM norm. So we can still be in AM territory here. Now, if you have more than one atom, what's going to happen is that um, you can't stay in AM space because then the atoms can be permutated and those would be non trivial isometries technically. So you have to, if you have more than one atom, you lose the, uh, the property of being AM if you're renorming. So, so this is going to be the brief outline of the proof. First, we want to, um, we're going to renorm X so that it's what we call a regular AM space. And there's some properties that these spaces hold. Um, what's nice about them is that they can be expressed as some sublattice of a special kind of compact subset K. And the dual is easily identifiable. And then we're going to, to create the new norm. What we're going to do is we're going to add weights to underlying points in your K. So in, in the other case, you know, you were adding pimples to the uniball. And so the, the points somehow had their own kinds of weights or reverse weights, I guess. But here, what we're going to do is we're going to add weights to, uh, to elements in the underlying K. And this will um, kill any extra isometries. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use that dual space, that nicely identifiable dual space, to show that any isometries must, in fact, just be the trivial isometry. So, so let's start with defining um, these regular AM spaces. So given C greater than 1, a sublattice X of CK is a C regular AM space. And if, first of all, there's some conditions on your K. Um, K is some disjoint union of a bunch of other KIs and either finitely many, or if you have countably many, there's some point infinity where it just kind of converges. And we also have that um, in the case that you have infinitely many, then X is just going to be some uh, sublattice of a C0 of K with X infinity equal to zero. Then second, um, what we have are some restrictions on the kinds of conditions you can place on the AM space. So if you have a T in KM, S in KM, then X of T is equal to lambda XS for all, and, and you have this kind of condition with that extra lambda, then lambda is just some power of C, in particular C to the N minus N. So what that does is, you can't just have like any sort of condition. You actually are very limited in the kind of conditions you can place for T and S in different KM and N. Um, on the other hand, within the KN, you have separations of points. So you don't have any of these conditions within a single KN. And so the, the inspiration for this kind of construction, it seems kind of weird. Um, there was actually, this construction was actually found in Benjamini's 1973 paper, where he shows that uh, G spaces, uh, Grothendieck spaces have, are linearly isomorphic to C of K. So he starts with a sort of renorming that is essentially a two regular um, AM space. And in fact, one thing that's nice about these, these seem very specific, but it turns out that um, any separable AM space can be approximated by a C regular AM space for any C um, 
40 C greater than one. So, and, and the way this works is that it's kind of, it, I, I like to think of it something like a sort of resolution, uh, putting certain amounts of resolution on your, C, on your AM space. So we can just like break up certain portions right here. And then the parts that are anything that has like the same like lambda equal one or lambda equal zero, these just become one point so that this will induce a certain separation of points right here. Um, okay. And then the result <laughs> is that you have something that looks like these portions right here end up becoming your individual KNs. Um, and they're dependent on how much, how, how different they are in the, under the conditions, right? So, so what you do is you, you basically turn some of these things into step functions, but then the steps are within their own um, connected or their own components. So there's, there's some interesting structures. So these, these regular spaces have certain particular properties and structures to them. So first part is if you have um, given some n <coughs> not equal to n, we're going to define the set D, M, N to be all the T in your KNs so that there is some S in KN where you have that kind of um, additional AM condition that for all x and x, x of t is equal to c to the n minus m xs, right? So these are the, these points are fixed with each other. And it turns out that um, if you look at in turn, all the s and kn, you, this s and kn happens to be in some d n m, right? It turns out that this d m n is homeomorphic to d n m. These also are closed um, subsets here. So what we can do then is that we can induce a map from DMN to DNM so that for all F and X, FS is equal to C to the N minus N, F of phi MNS. So what's, what's nice about this then is that you can have certain, you can have certain canonical points, right? That, are used to determine what the value of the function is for the rest of the points. So I might have, for instance, my, imagine my K, and I'm thinking of the, think of these individual rows as your K, uh, KNs, and then we can probably have some infinity here, right? And I can think then, maybe this is my D12, it's actually just a single point. Um, yeah, no, right here. So you have something like this, and you have maybe some portion right here. You might have D13. You got a little bit right there. Maybe D14 is, there's probably something in common right here. And you got this little bit here, right? And, and so on and so forth. So you can then take this portion right here, which are these, these are like the representative points, and then they might find copies or echoes further down as you go down the KMs. Um, you also have, you can have atoms in your space, and these are characterized by hereditarily isolated points. K in your K prime end. So you might have some atom here and say K3 and um, some isolated points in your K3. Then what's going to happen is this, if this happens to be in some D3L, for instance, you go down to your line L and then you want that point also to be isolated. And so the atoms then are going to be these functions where you are zero out in, you are equal to say one on your K prime, the point that's in the K prime. And then as if you happen to find the isolated point uh, echoes further down here, they're going to be evaluated at the appropriate 
um, of the, the appropriate C to the N minus N. And then outside of those isolated points, you have this theta of K of T equal to zero. So the atoms look like this. So these AM spaces, the regular AM spaces also have this certain kind of extension here. And so if you think of Verisone's lemma, you have some points, some closed space, and then I can do some continuous function where the point is um, evaluated at one, and then at the other closed space, you get zero, right? And we can do certain things like that in the AM spaces, uh, these regular AM spaces. So first we have um, a C regular AM space with some underlying sets Kn. Then we say that a function, that like a sort of partial function on your k is consistent if x to the s is equal to c to the n minus n times x to the phi mn um, s for all s and km. So basically the idea is I we say that the function is consistent if I'm looking at a certain portion of my, you know, from m to n. And then right here we have some function, but then anything that's in your DMNs is going to echo correctly in the parts outside of your K prime. And so if you have a function like X, uh, some X that is consistent, then I extend, I can extend my X to some function in my AM space, X, uh, X tilde, so that for all j greater than n, it's not going to be so big. It's only going to be as big as whatever, whatever the echo allows it to be. I can also ensure that my data <coughs> x is bounded by some y if there is some y in x plus that is greater than my x. So I can, I can keep things under control when I do my extensions. We also have this kind of point separation in AM spaces. So there's a lot of technical stuff here, but basically if you have some point, um, say some point T in K prime of N, S in K prime of N, and then you have some open space, U and V such that the closures are still in K prime. Then I can take for any alpha and beta between zero and infinity, I can extend my X in X plus so that anything above here is zero. Um, anything right here is consistent. And then uh, whatever's outside of the open sets in K prime, we can, we can bring it down to zero. And then we can just extend everything downwards in a way that is controlled. So that's all, like all of that very technical stuff. That's basically what's happening. We can extend in nice ways and we can also separate points under these conditions. So based on this, you can use those kinds of lemmas to give this kind of result. So you can use it to figure out the dual. And, and the reason why this works is because notice that if I have, again, everything defined in my K prime, then it determines the rest of the function everywhere else in my K. And so that's, so that's the purpose of these lemmas is to show how you can do these kinds of constructions. The other thing also is um, if it, your dual is isometric to this, this, this set of measures, um, on these K primes, on the K prime. And then also the atoms on your X star is determined by these particular, um, by the points in your K prime. So these, so that's, so, um, so to, to state more formally, you have script A1, the set of normalized atoms in X star, you equip um, A1 with the weak star topology, then this, a1 is going to be homeomorphic to K prime itself. And again, the, the atoms in the XR, they, they, they correspond to these evaluation functionals over the elements in the K prime. So now let's, we can now define our norm. 
So um, start with, you have the atoms in X, we're gonna call them theta I, and we're gonna index our atoms with some indexing set I. Um, it could be either finite interval or all the natural numbers. And each theta I recall is going to correspond to some hereditarily isolated point, um, your AI and K prime, so like this point right here. And we're gonna, we're gonna assume that this C that we want to control our distortion by with our renorming, we're just gonna assume it's less than two and um, we're gonna let little C become this root function. And, and basically when you see the little C, there's some computations that are involved with that, but just, just know that this little C is related to the big C when you see the renormings. We're gonna also figure, uh, we're gonna also um, catalog the ends for which your k prime of ends are infinite or whether they're finite. And for any of the ends where your um, ends in B, where your k prime of n is non empty finite, what we're going to do is we're going to take all of those points and label them according to um, just, just enumerate them. And then for any n where the um, where a is for any n in A, i.e. where the k prime of n is infinite, we're gonna pick a countable dense subset and we're gonna just get sequence of those. So for the n's in A, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna start picking our weights, right? We mentioned that these um, renormings involve these um, weighting of the points. So this is what we're gonna do now. We'll pick um, these decreasing L uh, lambda ones to the n's, given that n in A, and you want the limit to be equal to one. And for N and B, we just have a finite decreasing sequence where all of your elements are greater than one, but they are less than this little C. Now for T equal to K prime, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna define mu of T to be equal to lambda I N, if T is one of these I Ns that are listed here, and then we'll let mu of T equal to one otherwise. So, Again, the lambdas, what we also want is that these lambdas are all distinct from each other. So now we are ready to give our normal definition. So if you are atomless, there's no atoms in your space, what we can just do is let the renormed X equal to this weighted supremum. Actually very simple, nice to see. And we only need to look at the K primes because anything in K is going to be just an echo of the original elements in the K primes. For the atoms equal to one, we are going to take our little I, um, our little atom here, and we just take the projection of a given x down to that atom. So that's going to be our p one. And for any phi m n and a, and then simply we'll just call X1 just the kernel of the P1. So basically at the atomless portion of your space. And we'll let the renormed X then just be the max of the atomless portion and then whatever it is at the atom. So also pretty simple. And obviously that atom can't really go anywhere. So um, whatever is gonna hold for this top portion will also hold here pretty easily. Now things get a little more complicated when you have more than one atom, right? What's gonna happen is we have to deal with, we wanna, we wanna renorm in such a way that permutations can't happen. So given we're gonna, and we index our atoms, again, natural numbers or some finite interval, we let script P be these, um, the tuples in I squared with I, and G, I less than J. And then we just let pi from script P to N be an injection. So given this tuple, we let um, this norm, we're gonna define a norm on R2 for each tuple whose uniball is the octagon with these vertices. And so C remember is gonna be some number pretty close to one. And then we are going to multiply this, um, I'm gonna take C, to two pi times i j plus one. So it's gonna be some also bigger, some you're gonna take points that are pretty close to um to the to the point one one. And so if you will take like the positive cone of this thing, 
what you will end up with is something like here, right? And so you have just the corner of the octagon, right? And the key is to ensure that these points are not necessarily like exactly the same apart so you can't flip things. You're gonna probably do something more like, I'll make it a little more obvious here, right? <clears throat> So they're only going to have certain uh, the, the 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 symmetries that won't really make it work. So, um, so this basically you have these bunch of these octagon intervals for these um, renormings of R two. And what we're going to do then is for the atoms theta a i, we're going to generate now the renorming. So you take the um, given some x, the renormed x will be just the max of these, the weighted portion, as in example of part one. And then also what we're gonna do is we'll take the supremums of the mu AIs, XAIs, mu AJs, XAJs. So, the, so obviously the mu AI and the XAI, that's gonna be some evaluation, right? And the same with the AJs. And so that just, we just put that into this um, close to, L infinity, L2 of infinity norm. So one thing to note um, that given the, the way we define these octagons, they're all mutually distinct from each other. And so what we're gonna have is that if you take the formal identity from R2 of the, with the renormed I, J1, I1 and J1, and then map it to the R2 with the I2, J2. This is gonna be an isometry, assuming you fix the first, um, the, the, the first atom with the first atom, the second atom with the second atom. This is an isometry if and only if your I1 is equal to I2 and J1 is equal to J2, right? So you can't allow for these kinds of, uh, any kind of permutation like this. So, so now, Let's suppose that T is an isometry. How much time do I have? Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> so suppose T is an isometry over my renormed X. So one thing that we can show is that for any T in K prime, the, the norm of the mu T delta T, where delta T is the evaluation functional, that's going to equal one. And so the way this works is that, again, to use our little K prime example, right, so we're right here. And I'm making that point right here. So say I have a T and I have right here, here, so the way this works is I want to find, um, what I want to do is I want to find some, um, some function in X where the, the norm is really as close to one as I would like, but then also it's not going to be um, it's not going to be shooting over, right? And so to do this, we use these extension and, and um, these extension and point separation lemmas that we were talking about earlier. And we want to steer clear of any of the points up to a certain amount that are weighted too highly, right? So that's that's the idea behind some of those extension lemmas. We can we can make sure that. Um, your mu t of delta t is equal to one. Of course, if your t is some ti, uh, t and i, then this mu of t is going to have is going to be a little bigger than it's gonna, what it's going to be. Yeah, it's going to be bigger or smaller. I think it was bigger. What I said earlier. Um, and similarly, one one thing that we have also is that if your t is an isometry. Um, the atom theta i in our list of atoms here have to be mapped to themselves, 
right? And and the reason is because of that, um, if because of those um, those uh, L infinity, those L two norms, R two norms that we had before. Those uh, those prevent us from allowing permutations to be included as an isometry. So by the way, that's a little bit here. I mean, now, if we if our if we were dealing, for instance, with um, our x equal to c0, we've already shown that c0's isometries can be killed with this norm, just with the, the portion of the atoms. Now, also, if you have, um, so this is another little property right here. If you have m and n in natural numbers and your t in k prime of n, and then you have a sequence ti that converges to some s, right? So you got your sequence, it's it's um, is it is maybe maybe this is our M. You got some stuff here. You got um, some other N right here, and you have a sequence right here that goes that's along your KN, and it converges to some S. So these are then the following are equivalent. The first is that you have m greater than or equal to n, and then s is some echo of t, right? So maybe we're going somewhere in here, and then we manage to just converge to some point over here. Um, and it has, and it's somewhere below our kn. Um, and the second thing is that the weak star limit of this, these new um, new ti's delta ti's is some alpha times mu of t delta t. <clears throat> for n is greater than zero. So keep in mind there that um, that if you manage to hit this s right here, that's going to be some that's going to be some uh, echo of here. But then in the dual space, recall that these are since these are related. This is really like this is the determining point here. So. So of course, if, if then if one holds, um, then two holds, and we can determine what the alpha is. And it's just gonna be what we expected, the C times N minus M over mu of T. So then, so, so we have some ideas of what happens with these um, convergent sequences, assuming this isometry. Um, another, another a little approximation lemma here, is that, or convergence on here, is that we have, suppose you have some t and k prime of n, and now we're not assuming that your sequence is inside some other k of m. Um, we just assume that's in this k prime and it doesn't include t. Then the following two are equivalent. So at some point, so the first property is that there's some n so that for large, uh, large enough i, the ti's are in some k prime of m. And then the ti converges to some echo of your t. And then that's going to be equivalent to the mti's delta ti's converging to some alpha and mu of t delta t for some n greater than zero. And so the idea here is that you, you basically use the first lemma here to prove the second, and of course, properties of compactness and whatnot. And then, of course, if one holds, then two also holds as well. So the, the moral of the story here is that we see these kinds of <coughs> convergences or sequences in, in your K primes and K in general corresponds to what you would expect the delta, the, the functionals, the, the sequences of functionals to act. And so you have convergence and convergence in both instances. All right, so now we're going to show that this that this renorming is in fact the renorming the renorming that satisfies those conditions for killing our isometries. So start with an isometry on your renormed X. Um, your your T star is interval preserving, so it, and it's isometric, so it sends your atoms to atoms. <laughs> and then the normalized atoms, remember, are of the form um, mu of k delta k with k and k prime. Of course, if your k is hereditarily isolated, 
we already shown this before, your T star of mu k delta k's are going to be just sent to themselves, given these, um, given the um, our two norms that we had. Um, so we want to show them that since, again, since your T star is isometric in integral preserving, again, we have the atoms going to atoms in your X star, right? And so, again, the atoms are homeomorphic then to your K prime, if you assume the weak star topology. And so there is some underlying psi from K prime to K prime that reflects what this T is doing here. So the T star of mu K of delta K is going to be mu of psi K um, delta psi K. So what we want to do is show that this psi is in fact the identity because your atoms are weak star dense in the dual. And that and then we can use that to extend to an identity in the whole map. So we've already dealt with the Ks that are not, that are hereditarily isolated. In other words, corresponding to the atoms in K, in X. So we want to have, so now it remains for us to show what happens when your K is not hereditarily isolated. So at that point, then there must be some sequence mu i in your k prime so that um, the u i's, so that the mu of u i's delta u i uh, weak star converge to the alpha mu k's delta k's. And this is because, again, not hereditarily isolated means that I can approach somewhere the points either that uh, up to some echo of that point or to the point itself. Right? And then I use these um, the convergence lemmas to say, oh, okay, well, if I have convergence to the point or some echo of it, then that means that I have some weak star convergence over my evaluation functionals up to some alpha times mu k of delta k. Um, T star is also uh, weak star continuous. And these mu, these mu k's, because I'm getting some sequence that's not including the point itself. Remember that these might be weighted points or not. So, but then, the, then my, my weights are also decreasing, going down to one. And so what we then have is that your alpha is equal to one and my mu of k is in fact equal to my mu of psi of k. So they have the same weight. So this, this isometry must map, to, must map atoms to atoms of the same weight. What this implies then is that if your k is equal to your TINs, the weights are all unique for the TINs. So that means then that the psi of k can only map, can only equal k at that point. So now we have um, psi of k mapping points to themselves for this dense many countable uh, elements in k prime. But if you don't have a k in, that is equal to the TIN, we again use that density of points and that same kind of argument um, that we can approach your points using the TINs, your lambdas are going to one. And then we of course use the, the weak star continuity star. So that means then that even if your K is not TIN, because I can approach, I can, I can approach the, TI, uh, the T with points that are these TINs that are just where the, on one hand you have the TIN going to, um, to T and then also the psi of TINs going to psi of T, but these are the same. So T has to equal psi of T as well. And so that means then that we were able to show that the psi is in fact the identity on K prime. So, so that's basically the proof for um, what happened for AM spaces. And so, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe killing isometries is kind of harsh, right? Maybe we don't want to kill all isometries in, um, in, in our space. So, so, that, so that led to some investigations on the Banach space level. So suppose, so, so here's some further directions that this could be taken. So you have a Banach space, turns out that the linear isometries on the form a Polish group. So a Polish space, separable, uh, complete metrizable space, and then you have topological group attached to it. Um, 
And then your group operation is composition. So if you have B, some space B and some Polish group uh, of subgroup of your isometries, can I renorm my B so that the remaining isometries are not just the identity, but maybe this Polish group? And so some other people later, uh, Galagov, uh, Renzi, Rosenthal, and, th and this was over some multiple papers, um, they investigated this. And they looked at, um, they, they got these kinds of results. So you suppose you have a B with an LUR norm and you have some Polish subgroup G. And of course your negative ones inside of G because you can't renorm without having a negative identity in there. Um, suppose you have some normalized vector that is, that is um, such that the image of this vectors are all really separate from each other for every element in the group. So these are these, uh, these separated points. Then B admits an equivalent norm so that G is equal to the isometry, the, the linear isometry group of your uh, renormed G. So basically, remember how I mentioned earlier with Bellino's approach to build these pimples? Well, the way they do this is they take pimples of different sizes to kill certain isometries, but then for points that are in, um, that are images of X zero under elements in your group, we're gonna keep those pimples the same size. So it, it, the X zero serves as a sort of um, cataloging of, at the X zero catalogs, the, where the isometries are supposed to be. And they also were able to show some other variations of this, uh, of these, of this, these group of questions. So maybe, maybe we don't have to have G B the exact isometry group, but maybe this sort of um, topological isomorphism is enough, right? So they were able to show that if you have a closed subgroup of S, in, um, S infinity, then I can renorm C zero so that G times plus or minus the identity is topologically isomorphic to the isometry of the isometry group of the renormed C0. And they they have the there's a way they do that is kind of uh, combinatorially almost pretty complicated here, but um, it was a very different approach. And then they were able to show also that any Polish group G can be um, represented as uh, as the isometry group of some Banach space that is that is renormed as, that is normed in some way. So that, that's that's I found that kind of cool. But excuse me, yeah. what is this infinity? Oh, as infinity, the um, the permutations are natural numbers. Ah, sure, yeah, okay. All right, so, so then of course we can have a sort of uh, a lattice analog of this question. So suppose you have a Banach lattice E and some Polish subgroup of the lattice isometries of E. So the lattice isometries also form a Polish subgroup, a Polish group. Um, so when can my E be renormed with an equivalent lattice norm this time so that G is equal to the isometry groups, uh, the isometry group of the renormed lattice E. And so, um, so this is still like some work in progress, probably in back burner right now because we're doing different things here and there, but we did get some results here on this. Um, so if you have, um, if you have E as a, with a smooth LUR norm, then there's a sort of, lot of there's a lattice analog for the result for uh, bullet point one, right? So you have some kind of sufficiently distinguished point and then you can construct these, these kind of uh, pimples that both kill isometries and preserve others, but then these pimples have to be solid pimples. So more like huge boils or something. <laughs> and, and then you can, you can still make a similar kind of argument. Um, but then we also looked at away from the LUR lattices and, Examine what could happen in 
maybe not an AM space, but in something that's a bit stronger, like a C0 of X space. And X is some locally compact Polish group. And we got a lot of, we got very different, um, some additional results there. So if you have locally compact Polish space and you have G a strong operator to call you closed subgroup of your isometry groups, G can then be represented um, as a homeomorphism in the underlying X. So suppose that you have every orbit of G on the underlying X. Um, suppose it's nowhere dense and G is equicontinuous on X. So basically you don't want things to move just a little bit on one point in the homeomorphism and then another point they, they move a lot. Then for all C greater than one, I can renorm my C0 of X so that G is now my isometry group on C0, on the renorm C0 of X. So one little, one example of this is like, say you have, um, you let X be the real numbers. And then I, the only isometry group I wanna keep is translations of the real numbers. So then I can renorm my C0 of X so that my isometry group is now just translations. So that's, that's the kind of idea that we were getting from something like this. Well, not translations. If you let R be, um, instead of R, you just let R be, you let R times some band like the unit interval, then, then your orbits are nowhere dense. So you can do something like that. So the question you might have on this one is, well, with AM spaces, we killed all these isometries. Is it possible for us to retain some isometries in this instance? And we haven't really touched too much of that. We looked at the case for C0 of X, but what can we do with AM spaces? And that's, so, that's it. <laughs>